Electromagnetic radiation is classically understood in terms of wave motion, but Hertz threw doubt on the validity of this belief. He noticed that the presence of light made the space between two metal spheres conduct electricity more readily. Light gives energy to the electrons on the metal's surface, which allows them to break free. This is called the photoelectric effect. It was discovered that when the intensity of the light increased, the number of the electrons released also increased, but their kinetic energy did not. This was inconsistent with the wave theory of light. The wave theory of light states that the greater the intensity of the light, the greater the energy released from the light source per second. This explains why the number of electrons released is proportional to intensity, but not why the kinetic energy of the released electrons remains constant. Wave theory was also thrown into doubt by the discovery that electrons are not emitted for all wavelengths of light. Planck concluded that light energy is emitted in separate packets of energy. Until this theory was proposed, it was believed that the energy of light was emitted continuously. Einstein used Planck's theory to explain the photoelectric effect. He called the packets of energy photons, and this is how they are referred to today. When the intensity of light increases, the number of photons increases. The energy of the photon is independent of the light's intensity. However, it is proportional to the frequency of the light. This explains Hertz's observations that the number of electrons released increases with light intensity, but the kinetic energy of the electrons released is independent of the light intensity. The photoelectric effect is the name given to the process by which electrons are released from a metal due to energy gained from light. The number of electrons released is proportional to the intensity of the light, and their kinetic energy is proportional to the light's frequency. The energy given to an electron by a photon can be calculated using the formula E equals HF. Not all wavelengths of light cause electrons to be released from a metal. This is because there is a minimum amount of energy required to release a delocalized electron against the pull of positive ions. This minimum energy is called the work function. F0 is the threshold frequency. This is the minimum frequency of light necessary for the photons to have sufficient energy to release any electrons. Classical wave theory states that V equals F lambda, so F equals V over lambda. F is inversely proportional to lambda, so the threshold wavelength is the maximum wavelength at which the photons of light will contain sufficient energy to release electrons. Because quantum theory deals with occurrences at an atomic level, the quantities involved are very small. The work function value is therefore often given in electron volts. The energy of an electron volt is equal to the charge of an electron multiplied by one volt. One electron volt has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. The fact that the photoelectric effect revealed waves to have a particulate nature led de Broglie to hypothesize that all particles could in turn display wave behavior. De Broglie suggested that any moving particle has a wavelength which can be calculated. All physical quantities can be described in terms of either waves or particles. This phenomenon is commonly known as wave-particle duality. Waves and particles are linked through the relations E equals HF and lambda equals H over P. A couple of years after de Broglie suggested the theory of wave-particle duality, it was discovered that a beam of electrons directed at a crystal 
the atoms of which behave as a diffraction grating, produces a ring diffraction pattern on a screen, similar to that produced by X-rays. This proved de Broglie's theory, as the electrons seem to leave the filament as particles, pass through the diffraction grating as waves, and arrive at the screen as particles. It is therefore fair to conclude that all matter has a dual nature. If more energy than the work function is given to an electron, it will not just be liberated from the metal, but will also have kinetic energy. Einstein's photoelectric equation allows this kinetic energy to be quantified. Photon energy equals work function energy plus the maximum kinetic energy of the electron. In 1911, Bohr suggested that atoms contain a number of defined energy levels. The energy of an atom is the energy of the electrons which orbit its nucleus. Electrons cannot exist between these specific energy levels. When bombarded by other atoms or electrons during processes such as heating, the electron may absorb energy in quanta of certain amounts. Having gained this extra energy, the electron is now said to occupy an excited state and exists in a higher energy level. The amount of energy needed to excite an atom is called the excitation energy. Specific energy levels vary for each element. When an electron enters an excited state, it becomes unstable and returns to a lower energy level after a minute period of time in order to regain stability. The energy lost when the fall occurs is emitted in the form of electromagnetic radiation. This can be substantiated using evidence from atomic line spectra. A gas is placed in a discharge tube at a low pressure, and a high potential difference is set up across it. The high potential difference enables atoms to move into a higher energy level. The atoms then fall from this excited state, emitting electromagnetic radiation in the process. By passing the emitted radiation through a prism or diffraction grating, the emission spectra can be seen to consist of well-defined separate lines. The separation of these lines is experimental evidence for the existence of discrete energy levels in the atom.
The generally accepted model for the structure of the atom looks like this. It's known as the nuclear model of the atom. Atoms consist of a small nucleus containing protons and neutrons, orbited at some distance by electrons. Evidence for this model of the atom is provided by the alpha particle scattering experiment, which was first performed by Geiger and Marsden under the guidance of Rutherford in 1909. Sheets of gold foil, only a few hundred atoms thick, were bombarded by alpha particles and their resulting paths recorded. The scattered alpha particles were detected by specially coated screens. Alpha particles are helium nuclei, which have a positive charge. Most of the alpha particles passed straight through the foil, undeflected, meaning that they had not collided with any gold nuclei. This was expected as positive alpha particles are heavier than electrons and push them aside. But one in 8,000 particles was deflected by more than 90 degrees. These had collided with the atom's positive nucleus. This experiment shows that all the atom's positive charge is concentrated in the nucleus. Most of the atom's mass is also concentrated in the nucleus. The orbits of the electrons are large in relation to the nucleus. The diameter of the atom is 10,000 times that of the nucleus. This is comparable to the size of a coin in relation to a football stadium. Atoms are mostly empty space. There are three types of radioactive emission. Alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. When a radioactive particle enters the Geiger-Muller tube, it ionizes some of the gas. This causes a flow of charge between the positive central electrode, the anode, and the negative casing, the cathode. These pulses of current are electronically counted. The bromine present prevents the flow of charge becoming continuous, so the individual pulses are evident. When elements emit radioactive particles, their nucleon and proton numbers change. In beta particle emission, a neutron in the parent nucleus turns into a proton and an electron, the beta particle, so producing a new daughter nucleus. Radioactive atoms decay spontaneously and randomly. It is not possible to predict which atom will disintegrate next, but the decay obeys the statistical law of chance. The number of atoms decaying per second is directly proportional to the number of atoms in the sample. This graph shows exponential decay. This means that the number of undecayed atoms remaining decreases by a constant factor in equal intervals of time. Exponential decay can be said to have a constant half-life, as the time taken for half the radioactive nuclei present to decay is constant. The number of atoms remaining in a sample at any point can be calculated using the equation shown here. Atoms with a large proton number, above 83, are unstable and gradually decay. They can also become more stable by splitting into two approximately equal fragments. This process of splitting is called nuclear fission. 
Large nuclei, such as those belonging to barium or krypton, may split to form two smaller daughter nuclei and some neutrons. This is known as spontaneous fission. Fission may also occur when a neutron collides with and is absorbed by a large nucleus. This makes it more unstable, so it splits in two, releasing more neutrons, which may in turn cause the fission of other atoms. It is a chain reaction. This is called neutron-induced fission. As unstable nuclei split to form more stable nuclei, energy is released. This is due to the fact that the two product nuclei have a greater combined binding energy. During nuclear fission, the proton and neutron numbers are conserved. The reaction can be represented using a fission equation. Atoms with a small number of protons can become more stable by joining together. The binding energy of the product nucleus is greater than that of the original nuclei, so energy is released equal to the increase of the binding energy. This joining process is called nuclear fusion and is the source of energy for stars like the Sun. Often, more than one particle is produced. Einstein found that increasing the kinetic energy of an object leads to an increase in its mass until its mass becomes infinite at the speed of light. He then postulated that, generally, increasing the energy of an object increases its mass, and thus showed that energy and mass are equivalent or interchangeable quantities. The energy produced by a change of mass is given by the formula E equals mc squared. This formula applies to all energy changes. The mass of an atom is less than the mass of its constituent parts. The difference between the mass of an atom and of the parts is called the mass defect. Einstein's equation tells us that the mass of the constituent parts minus the mass of the atom equals the mass equivalent of the energy it would take to separate the atom into its constituent parts. The energy needed to separate a nucleus into its constituent parts is called the binding energy. The binding energy of a nucleus is equal to the energy equivalent of the mass defect. The higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable the nucleus is. As binding energy decreases, the nuclei are more likely to split or fuse to achieve stability. Binding energy is measured either in joules or mega electron volts. Energy is released during nuclear fission because the mass defect of the two product nuclei is more than that of the parent nucleus. The difference in mass is lost as energy. As the mass defect is higher, the new nuclei have a high binding energy and are therefore more stable than the parent nucleus. Energy is released during nuclear fusion because the mass defect of the product nucleus is greater than the combined mass defect of the original nuclei. At an atomic level, mass is sometimes expressed in terms of atomic mass units, U. One U is defined as one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. The Avogadro constant must be known in order to calculate this mass. The Avogadro constant is the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. The energy equivalent of one atomic mass unit is 931 mega electron volts.
Waves involve a disturbance from the equilibrium position, which travels from one region to another. Mechanical waves, such as water, sound and shock waves, travel through a medium. Progressive waves distribute energy from a point source to the surrounding area. For example, circular waves caused by a rain droplet on a pond. The direction in which the particle displacement occurs, in relation to the direction in which the wave travels, affects its properties. All waves can be categorized as one of two types, transverse or longitudinal. In transverse waves, the direction of the particle movement is perpendicular to the direction of the wave's propagation. Examples include water waves and all electromagnetic waves. In longitudinal waves, the direction of the particle motion is the same as the direction of the wave's propagation. The particle movement is a series of compressions and rarefactions. Sound waves are an example of longitudinal waves. This diagram shows the two types of wave established on a slinky spring. The particle motion in a transverse wave can be in one of an infinite number of planes perpendicular to the direction of the wave's propagation. This is known as an unpolarized wave. Polarization is the process by which a wave's oscillations are made to occur in one plane only. In order to polarize a wave, it is effectively passed through a grid of parallel bars. Only the oscillations in a plane parallel to those bars can pass through. When waves pass through gaps or around obstacles, they spread out. This is known as diffraction. The nearer the slit size is to the wavelength of the wave, the greater the diffraction of the wave. Both transverse and longitudinal waves can be diffracted. Davison and Germer discovered that electron beams can also be diffracted. This shows that particles exhibit wave properties and supported de Broglie's theory of wave-particle duality. When considering the behavior of two coherent waves from sources close to each other, relationships between them must be considered. The difference in the distance between each source and a particular point is known as the path difference. It can be measured in meters or wavelengths. The phase difference is the amount by which two waves with similar frequencies are at different stages in their oscillations at a given time. It can be measured in wavelengths, degrees, or radians. One complete oscillation is equivalent to one wavelength, 360 degrees, or two pi radians. This diagram shows waves with a phase difference of one quarter of a wavelength, 90 degrees, or pi over two radians. Waves are said to be coherent if they have the same wavelength, and there is a constant phase relationship between the two waves. Due to the fact that all waves contain imperfections, this can only occur if waves from a single monochromatic source are split into two, so that the imperfections occur simultaneously. When two coherent waves overlap, their displacements combine and interference can be observed. The combined effect at a point can be found by calculating the algebraic sum of their individual displacements. When the identical waves are either exactly in phase or half a wavelength out of phase, the resultant amplitude is either double the amplitude of an original wave or zero.
the interference of waves placed on top of one another is called superposition. It occurs when two or more waves overlap, regardless of whether or not they are coherent. The principle of superposition states that the resultant particle displacement at any point is the sum of the separate displacements of the wave at that point. It is possible to show the effects of superposition using laboratory equipment. The apparatus is set up as shown in this diagram. The light source is monochromatic and the double slit ensures that the light sources interfering are coherent. It is clear that interference occurs. The pattern of light and dark patches shown on the screen is known as an interference fringe. The dark areas on this fringe show the places where the two waves are 180 degrees out of phase when they hit the screen. As a result, destructive interference occurs and they cancel each other out. The bright areas are the places where the two waves are exactly in phase when they hit the screen. This means that constructive interference occurs and the wave's amplitudes reinforce each other. If the slit separation, fringe separation, and the distance from the slit to the screen are measured, then the wavelength of the light passing through the slits can be calculated using this formula. Standing waves are set up as a result of the superposition of two waves with the same amplitude and frequency traveling at the same speed in opposite directions. Standing waves are also known as stationary waves. This does not mean that nothing is moving, but that the positions of the crests and troughs are stationary. The parts of the wave where the amplitude is always zero are called nodes. Halfway between each node, where the amplitude is at a maximum, are points called antinodes. The lowest possible frequency at which a standing wave can be set up in a closed pipe is called the fundamental, or first harmonic. At higher frequencies, which are multiples of the fundamental, other patterns appear. These are called overtones. In a closed pipe, the wave must end in an antinode, so only odd multiples of the fundamental frequency will establish a standing wave. In an open pipe, both the open ends must be antinodes as the air must be free to move here. All points between the nodes of the vibrations are in phase. When a wave is incident on a surface, it is either absorbed, transmitted or reflected. If a wave is reflected, then its angle of incidence upon a plane surface will be equal to its angle of reflection. During reflection, the incident ray, reflected ray and normal are all in the same plane. The distance between the image and the mirror is equal to the distance between the object and the mirror. The image is laterally inverted. This is why writing appears back to front in a mirror. The image is the same size as the object. The image is virtual, as there is no light coming from it. Waves are bent at the boundaries between two mediums of different densities. This bending is called refraction. When a wave travels from a less dense to a more dense medium, it is refracted towards the normal. Snell discovered that the signs of the angles of incidence and refraction have a constant ratio to each other. The speed of the wave in medium 1 divided by the speed of the wave in medium 2 is also a constant.
The ratio of sine i over sine r is known as the refractive index. The refractive index can also be calculated by finding the ratio of the speed of the wave in the first medium to the speed of the wave in the second medium. Refraction occurs because waves change their speed when they enter another medium. The wave's frequency remains constant, but when a wave enters a more dense medium, its wavelength decreases. As velocity equals frequency times wavelength, the wave's velocity also decreases. If a wave travels from a dense medium in which it is traveling slowly into a less dense medium, it is refracted away from the normal. If the angle of incidence is too large, then sine i will be greater than 1. As the sine of an angle cannot be greater than 1, refraction is not possible. The angle at which n sine i equals 1 is called the critical angle. At this angle of incidence, the wave will be refracted along the boundary of the mediums. If the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, no wave energy can escape from the boundary and it is reflected. Because no energy escapes, this is called total internal reflection. This phenomenon has many practical applications and is widely used in fiber optic cables for telecommunications, medical imaging and prismic binoculars. Circular motion is not limited to objects spinning on the end of a string. It is common in everyday life, when vehicles go around corners, and in items such as washing machines and fans. Planets also move with circular motion within their orbits. When considering circular motion, one cannot merely talk of speed as we do in linear motion. Instead, angular speed must be used. Consider an object moving about a fixed point with a uniform speed. To ensure that an object describes a circular path, a force must act on it to stop it flying off at a tangent. This force acts towards the center of the circle and is called centripetal force. The acceleration of the object is also directed towards the center as it is caused by the force. This is therefore called the centripetal acceleration. Angular speed is defined as the change of angle per second for an object moving about a fixed point. The angle is measured in radians, so angular speed is expressed in radians per second. If s is the length of the arc described by the object, the angle in radians is given as theta equals s over r, where r is the radius of the circle described. By rearranging this formula as shown below, angular velocity can be deduced. The instantaneous linear velocity is at a tangent to the circle at 90 degrees to the center. As linear velocity equals omega r and a equals v squared over r, centripetal acceleration a equals omega r squared over r. In the equation a equals minus omega squared r, the minus sign indicates that the acceleration is directed towards the center of the circle. Newton's second law states that force equals rate of change of momentum, or f, equals ma. This also applies to the centripetal force acting on a body moving with circular motion. As we have already seen, the centripetal acceleration acting on a body is A equals minus omega squared R, or V squared over R. We can substitute this into Newton's equation for force 
and use the following formula to calculate the centripetal force acting on a body moving with circular motion when it moves with a constant speed. F equals mv squared over r. Objects that move to and fro are said to oscillate. This can apply to anything from a child being pushed on a swing to the motion of a swinging pendulum, and even the pattern of an AC electrical supply. Wave motion can also be described in terms of particle oscillation. One complete oscillation is said to have taken place when a complete to and fro movement has occurred and the body has returned to its original position. The time taken for an oscillating object to complete one full oscillation is called the period. It is measured in seconds. If a number of oscillations are involved, we can work out t by dividing the total time taken by the number of oscillations completed. The frequency of oscillations is the number of complete oscillations undergone by an oscillating object in one second. Frequency is measured in hertz. If an object oscillates with a frequency of 1 hertz, it means that it completes one full oscillation per second. It is therefore clear that one can relate frequency and period easily as f equals 1 over t. Simple harmonic motion is a type of oscillatory movement whereby, during the course of a cycle of oscillation, a body or particle passes from one side of the equilibrium position to the other and back again. A displacement time graph for an object moving with SHM will display a sine curve. It is therefore not unusual to describe the motion of a body oscillating in this way as sinusoidal. The amplitude of oscillations is the maximum displacement of the object from the equilibrium position. Simple harmonic motion can be closely related to circular motion. This is necessary when considering oscillatory motion quantitatively. It is possible to set up a pendulum bob and a ball on a turntable so that their shadows are exactly in phase. Both circular motion and simple harmonic motion can be said to be sinusoidal. It is therefore possible to use the same equation for the acceleration of a body undergoing simple harmonic motion or circular motion. The negative sign in this equation indicates that the acceleration is directed towards the fixed point. The restoring force is proportional to the displacement from the equilibrium position and is directed towards it. One possible solution for the equation a equals minus omega squared x is x equals a cos omega t, where a is the acceleration and x is the displacement. It is necessary to learn both the equation and the solution. The following derivation is given purely as an explanation. The velocity of an object moving with simple harmonic motion can be easily calculated from a displacement time graph of its motion. The gradient of a displacement time graph gives the velocity of the object at that instant. It is therefore clear that the body is momentarily stationary at points A and C, but moving with maximum velocity at points B and D. The magnitude of the velocity at B will, however, be the same as that at D but with the opposite sign due to their opposing directions.
A complete cycle of simple harmonic motion can be represented as two pi radians. If there are f cycles per second, we say there are two pi f radians per second. This is the angular frequency. As frequency is the inverse of an oscillator's period, we can also say that omega equals two pi over t. If the total energy in an oscillating system remains constant, we say that the vibrations are free. The energy in the system changes from potential to kinetic and back every half cycle, but the total energy in the system is constant at all times. Oscillations like this can go on forever. In practice, the amplitude of vibrations becomes progressively smaller as energy is lost due to friction between the oscillating body and the particles in the air. If this did not happen, the world would be very noisy. As once set up, sound waves would continue forever. Damping is the process whereby oscillations gradually die out. This occurs due to loss of energy caused by friction. It's sometimes useful to damp vibrations, for example those of a car suspension, so that the car does not continue to bounce for a long period after it has passed over a bump. At the other extreme, suspension can be overdamped, in which case the car will jolt violently when the wheels go over a bump. This can cause damage to the car and discomfort for any passengers it is carrying. Overdamping also means that there is a long delay before the suspension can react to any further bumps. Graph A shows free oscillations in which the vibrations continue at the same amplitude ad infinitum. This is a purely hypothetical situation as it can only occur when no frictional forces act on the body. Graph B shows lightly damped oscillations in which the amplitude of the vibrations gradually decreases with time. Graph C shows a system which is critically damped. This means that the system returns to its rest position in the shortest possible time without oscillating. Graph D shows a system which has been overdamped, so no oscillations take place, but the system takes a long time to return to its rest position. In order to maintain constant oscillatory motion, in a system which contains a degree of damping, an outside periodic force must be applied. The frequency of undamped oscillations in a system which has been allowed to oscillate on its own is called the natural frequency. If the frequency of the applied driving force equals the natural frequency of the system, then oscillations with a maximum amplitude occur. This effect is known as resonance. Resonance will not occur if the frequency of the driving force is too fast or too slow. During resonance, vibrations can build up to dangerous levels. Resonance is evident in many aspects of everyday life. In some cases, it can be very useful, but it can also be detrimental. Washing machines and buses often vibrate violently when the engine or drum oscillates at its natural frequency. A singer maintaining a note which has the resonant frequency of a glass can cause it to shatter. It's also necessary for soldiers to break their march when crossing bridges, in case their steps correlate with the natural frequency of the bridge, causing it to vibrate wildly and collapse. In one famous case, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was caused to resonate as a result of the frequency of the driving force of the wind and consequently collapsed. Resonance also has many useful applications. 
In musical instruments, if the vibration of a reed or string matches the natural frequency of the air column, resonance occurs. When this happens, the amplitude of the sound wave increases and a loud sound is heard. Microwave cookery uses the phenomenon of resonating water molecules in food to cause intermolecular friction and consequent heating. Radios are tuned by making the natural frequency of the electrical oscillations equal to that of the incoming signal so that electrical resonance occurs. In this way, the required frequency is isolated and amplified.